Normal tension glaucoma, sometimes called low tension glaucoma. Really, the pressure is not low, it's in a normal range. So I think normal tension glaucoma, probably a better term. It's a disease that has all of the features of primary open angle glaucoma, optic nerve head cupping, and visual field loss, but without a documented elevated intraocular pressure. It's really important to recognize that nothing magic happens at an intraocular pressure of 21 millimeters of mercury. There's really no difference between someone with a peak pressure of 20 and someone with a peak pressure of 22, even though one might call the first person normal tension and the second person primary open angle glaucoma. It's extremely arbitrary. But there's probably a difference between someone with a peak pressure of 20 and someone with a peak pressure of 45 millimeters of mercury. It seems that glaucoma that occurs at lower intraocular pressures is more of a vascular etiology than glaucoma that occurs at higher pressures. And even though it's normal pressure glaucoma, normal tension glaucoma, the intraocular pressure is still important. In eyes that have asymmetric disease, there is more damage in the eye with a higher pressure. And as we'll talk about uh, towards the end of this talk in the collaborative normal tension glaucoma study, lowering intraocular pressure is effective in decreasing the risk of progression. There are some people who really bristle and really dislike the term normal tension glaucoma or low tension glaucoma, and I fully understand that because I, what their point is, that it's very arbitrary to separate out these people from people who have damage at higher pressures. But most of us do think about normal tension glaucoma as being a little bit different, being a disease that's somewhat more vascular. Um, but recognize that some of your colleagues will not like that term. In the Baltimore Eye Study, half of people who had primary open angle glaucoma had pressures that were in the normal range at initial examination. And in some populations, especially the Japanese, glaucoma at normal pressures is very common, more common even than in this country in the U.S. There are a lot of things that are associated with normal tension glaucoma, uh, advanced age, history of vasospastic disease, such as migraine headache history or Raynaud phenomenon. Some people describe an autoimmune uh, association Patients can have a history of severe hypotension or shock and nocturnal hypotension from perhaps being over-medicated for systemic blood pressure issues. We'll go through this a little bit more. Well, there's been a lot of work done trying to understand the molecular biology of normal tension glaucoma. There's really one gene that has had a lot of evidence to show that it's involved, and that's optineurin, which causes a small percentage of normal tension glaucoma. Like primary open angle glaucoma, these patients are asymptomatic until late in their disease course. Unfortunately, they're not detected by intraocular pressure testing that someone might have, be diagnosed with higher pressure glaucoma because they go to get glasses and their intraocular pressure is 35. So it makes it a little bit easier to to miss people who have normal tension glaucoma. They often, though, have visual field loss closer to fixation, and that may make them symptomatic earlier. We'd really obviously like to catch them before they're symptomatic. As we evaluate these patients, we carefully probe their history for possibility that they had elevated intraocular pressure in their past prior oral steroid use. Occasionally you'll see somebody who was on oral steroids for years. Uh, prior inflammation, burned out pigmentary glaucoma. But basically with normal tension glaucoma, when we see somebody who has cupping and field loss, but a normal intraocular pressure, we're trying to find something else to blame that on. Some people with normal tension glaucoma have a history of severe systemic hypotension, ruptured aortic aneurysm, severe automobile accident where they were in a coma or in the ICU for a long stretch of time and perhaps did not have adequate perfusion. 
in, in a study that Dr. Drance did in, in Vancouver, he looked at people who had ocular hypertension versus people who had normal tension glaucoma and found that people with normal tension glaucoma were more likely to have had some catastrophic medical issue uh, that might have left them hypotensive for a long period of time. While I've seen this, I haven't seen a lot of that. I, most of my patients with normal tension glaucoma do not have that kind of a history. But this is an example. This is a patient of mine. field on the left is from March 2011. And then two years later, a visual field. But in the interval, he had a severe myocardial infarction and spent two weeks in the intensive care unit and the thought is that that probably contributed to this rather profound loss of peripheral vision in a very short period of time. As I mentioned earlier, they're more likely to have a history of spastic diseases like Raynaud phenomenon or migraine headache. Again, contributing to the notion that normal tension glaucoma has a bit more of this vascular feel to it. Need to ask about medications that might lower blood pressure, especially if taking at bedtime. Uh, it's been shown that people who have stable normal pressure glaucoma, normal tension glaucoma, when you compare them with people who are continuing to advance despite having normal pressures in their eye and measure their blood pressure throughout 24 hours, the people who are advancing are much more likely to have a pronounced drop or dip in their blood pressure while they're sleeping. Occasionally, the internist will give patients their blood pressure medicines at night so that they won't fall and break their hips because they can sometimes become syncopal. And it takes some diplomatic negotiations with the internist to make sure that we're not over-medicating people. So I will sometimes, not often, send patients for 24-hour blood pressure monitoring if they're on systemic medications for blood pressure, and I'm suspicious that their advancing glaucoma is caused by their systemic hypotension. One can ask for a history of autoimmune disease. There are some studies that suggest that autoimmune disease is associated with normal tension glaucoma. And more recently, we're finding that people who have low cerebrospinal fluid pressure um, can have evidence of advancing glaucoma, that having a low CSF pressure is a risk factor for worsening glaucoma. This is a fairly new area of study, and I think uh, more needs to be learned about CSF pressure. As we evaluate these people, we do a full examination. In, Gonioscopy to rule out things like intermittent angle closure glaucoma, old pigment dispersion, and other things. Is there something that you can blame this on? Could this be high pressure that's intermittent or old? This is a 75-year-old patient who presented with normal pressure glaucoma and on slit lamp exam has a Kuchenberg spindle, completely normal intraocular pressures. And on transillumination has classic radial transillumination defects like one would see in pigment dispersion syndrome. And in the angle black pigment as one would see in pigment dispersion syndrome. Generally, 75-year-olds don't have active dispersion anymore. They no longer have backbone of the iris. So this is probably somebody who had pigment dispersion when he was a young man. It was never diagnosed. The pigment has cleared and stopped dispersing. And now he's left with optic nerve damage and visual field loss. And it comes in with the diagnosis of normal tension glaucoma. But my assumption in this person is that he had high pressures in the past and what we're seeing is old damage. Sometimes in these people with burned out pigment dispersion syndrome, one will see reversal of pigmentation in that there's more pigment in the upper angle than in the lower angle. Uh, and so there are very few things that cause that. Most times people who have pigmentation 
will have more in the bottom than the top from gravity. But if we see this inverse pigmentation where there's more above than below, then again consider burned out pigment dispersion syndrome. It's important to look carefully at the optic nerve to rule out congenital optic nerve diseases, or optic nerve head drusen, etc. This is a patient who has drusen. Um, not that easy to see necessarily on slit, la slit lamp examination of the optic nerve, but they autofluoresce as one can see here on the right. Diurnal curve testing is uh, sometimes getting a bad name. I do this periodically. I think that if I see somebody who is advancing despite having intraocular pressures that are always in the normal range, I will have them get a diurnal curve to make sure that they don't have a spike in pressure late at night or early in the morning. I don't do a lot of them and occasionally, as I said before, I will occasionally do this in conjunction with 24-hour blood pressure monitoring in someone who I think is being over medicated. Uh, for their blood pressure. When we look at the optic nerves, they are cupped because they are glaucomatous, but they tend to be often more focal than in higher pressure glaucoma, as we can see here. It looks like someone just took a little bite out of this optic nerve rim, and the rest of the rim looks pretty good. Just a few more examples of notching some people will call this an acquired pit, which to me is not that helpful a term, but you can see this notch in the inferior rim here and also here. And actually, one can see a, a swath of nerve fiber layer that's missing here. Optic nerve hemorrhages are more frequent in normal tension glaucoma, and they are a poor prognostic sign that the glaucoma is not well controlled. Sometimes they are not subtle, uh, like we're seeing here, but sometimes they're quite subtle. And often they're easiest to see on photographs. So we can see here these two very subtle hemorrhages. And many times the best way to, if you're concerned that the patient might have a hemorrhage, is to compare photographs. This patient has a very subtle optic nerve head hemorrhage that was really easiest to see after I looked at the old photograph and then it let me appreciate the fact that there's a little hemorrhage right here that actually extends out across the border of the rim. Like other forms of glaucoma, these patients have visual field loss. It's more frequently steeper, deeper, and closer to fixation. So these kinds of field loss patients that have this very profound drop right at fixation are somewhat more common in patients who have normal tension glaucoma. It's a patient who has a notch in this right eye with this fixation splitting field defect as you can see here. Very characteristic of normal tension glaucoma. This patient has vertical cupping, a hemorrhage. You can see these defects in the nerve fiber layer. And again, classic visual fill loss, it's splitting fixation. Some people will do neuroimaging for patients who have normal tension glaucoma. Uh, I find that uh, this is very low yield for people who have disease that looks exactly like glaucoma. Certainly if the visual field loss doesn't fit the optic nerves, or someone has a field loss that's far beyond the amount of cupping or doesn't match the cupping, then it would be reasonable to consider neuroimaging. But for somebody whose nerve looks exactly like glaucoma with a notch and a glaucomatous visual field defect, I don't find this to be particularly cost beneficial. We treat it like primary open angle glaucoma. The collaborative normal tension glaucoma study use a 30% pressure reduction, and because that was effective, that has become the standard that we all try to achieve. Remember that lowering pressure from a normal range is much harder than treating a high pressure. I always 
use the analogy with the patients that it's trying to have someone who's already slender lose 20 pounds. The body just doesn't like to go certain places. And so treating normal tension glaucoma to me can be quite difficult. Remember that the episcleral venous pressure is somewhere around 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury, and that's the potential lower limit of medications and trabeculoplasty. So we use the usual medications. Uh, tend to avoid uh, beta blockers because they can lower the blood pressure, and they are not very good at lowering intraocular pressure at night. The Logit study, which I'll talk about in a minute, showed an advantage of bromonidine over timolol. I think most people would start with a prostaglandin analog because it is the most effective at lowering the intraocular pressure. I do precious little trabeculoplasty for people with normal tension glaucoma, but there is evidence that if people are at the upper range of normal tension, like pressures of 19 and 20, that it may help some. But these patients in general are more likely to go on to trabeculectomy than patients who present with higher intraocular pressures. Well, there are two randomized clinical trials that I would like to talk about relative to normal tension glaucoma. And I have these little orange bands down the side to remind you that we're talking about a randomized trial. And really these are studies that are important at creating the framework for how we think about these diseases. Collaborative normal tension glaucoma study uh, is one of the most important studies in glaucoma. And the question basically is, does it help to lower the intraocular pressure if someone has glaucoma? Does it slow the disease progression? When this study was started in the 1980s, there really was no evidence that lowering pressure for normal tension glaucoma made sense. Patients were randomly assigned to be treated or followed, uh, and they were followed for changes in optic nerve appearance or reproducible changes in visual field, and a reading center would evaluate the patient's uh, studies. The primary results showed that in people who were treated, 12% progressed compared to 35% of the controls. And actually, the a study was so effective in preventing glaucomatous damage, it had to be stopped early because it was no longer fair to not treat people who had normal tension glaucoma. It's really important to recognize that in 65% of untreated patients in the study, there was no progression of glaucoma. And as I said, there was 12% of eyes that did progress despite treatment. Patients who were treated were more likely to have cataracts. Some of this was from surgery. Back then there was pilocarpine was being used, uh, but cataracts were more typically seen in the treated than the untreated group. The other randomized clinical trial is the LOGIT study, low pressure glaucoma treatment study. The question here was, is bromonidine preferable to timolol for the treatment of normal tension glaucoma? So patients were randomly assigned to one of these two medications and followed for visual field loss. The primary results showed that despite a similar drop in intraocular pressure, at 30 months, the bromonidine patients were less likely to progress about 9% of the time than the timolol patients about 39% of the time. there was a high percentage of drug intolerance to bromonidine. So a lot of debate has occurred about the LOGIT study. Is it the fact that bromonidine is neuroprotective or perhaps beta blockers are harmful to patients with normal tension glaucoma? In 2013, the Cochrane, uh, a Cochrane review was done that basically said that this trial did not provide evidence that they are effectively preventing retinal ganglion cell death and thus preserving vision in people with open angle glaucoma. In other words, there was not, according to the Cochrane Review, enough evidence to say that bromonidine was neuroprotective. One of the problems with the study was there was a huge dropout rate, especially in the bromonidine group, that made it a little bit difficult to prove 
this was neuroprotective. But I think the study has caused some of us to think that perhaps Timolol should not be high on our list of medications for normal tension glaucoma and other drugs, including bromonidine, might be a better choice after prostaglandins. I have two rules based on these studies for normal tension glaucoma that I always tell the residents and fellows. One is because 65% of people in the collaborative normal tension glaucoma study did not progress. I'm pretty slow to begin therapy. So if someone does not have fixation splitting field loss, they have clearly glaucomous optic nerve damage and field loss, but it's not really terrible, then I might not treat them. I would just follow them to see if they're progressing because they may not. And the exception, of course, would be people who have fix fixation splitting defect and severe field loss. You really can't wait to begin therapy. But for most patients, I would follow them carefully with fields and OCT and optic nerve examination and not begin therapy. But the second rule is, once I do recognize that they are getting worse, and I'm very aggressive in treating them and getting their pressure down by at least 30%. So the key points here, there's no magic at 21 millimeters of mercury. There's a continuum from high pressure to normal pressure glaucoma, normal tension glaucoma. There's nothing magic or spectacular that happens at 21 millimeters of mercury. This is a continuum with higher pressure glaucoma, but perhaps more vascular of a disease than people who have high pressure glaucoma. There's more focal cupping, usually, not always, and field loss that is steeper, deeper, and closer to fixation. And when we treat, and, and I would caution you to be careful about starting treatment. It's a very hard road, so I really want to be sure that I'm on the right road before I start treating. I'll usually follow them. If I have evidence that they're progressing, then I think I need to be very aggressive. As a collaborative normal tension glaucoma study showed us, we need to be aiming for about 30% pressure lowering. So normal tension glaucoma in my practice makes up a, a very large percentage of my practice, probably over a third. And you'll be dealing with these people no matter what sort of ophthalmology practice you go into. And you really need to have a plan of how to evaluate them and then how to treat them.